Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the linker morpheme in Gorwa, specifically how it has been analyzed, how I've analyzed it, and how it might be analyzed in the future. So the linker in Gorwa is a nominal morpheme with six different subgender sensitive allomorphs. The bolded forms in Shuftawak, one lip, Desir E, my girl, Hawato Baba, father's man, Kurki, this year, Aima Uren, big lands, and Aila Ter, a long wedding song, are all linkers. Nouns do not show linker morphology in uh, unmodified subjects, unmodified objects in second position, that is, before the selector, and in incorporated nouns, and nouns do show linker morphology everywhere else. Earlier accounts of linkers in southern Cushitic languages characterized them as construct state morphology, a form taken by nouns in many Afroasiatic languages when possessed. Following a discussion of why the idea of possession is not adequate to characterize all occurrences of linker morphology, an alternative is advanced, that linkers are obligatorily present on all nouns with reference, but go unpronounced when at the right edge of the phonological phrase. Finally, new analysis made in CARE 2020 is considered, as well as prospects for better understanding this pervasive phenomenon in Gorwa. But first, I would like to provide some further context, both, both about the Gorwa language as well as about the data used in this talk. Gorwa is a Cushitic language of the larger Afroasiatic phylum, spoken in north-central Tanzania in an area of more or less within the red circle in the map inset. Gorwa is spoken by no more than 133,000 people, and because of rapid social change taking place in the Gorwa-speaking area, including a rapid and widespread shift to Swahili, it should be considered an endangered language. For a sense of how Gorwa sounds, here is a brief recording of Akobu Sahware talking about harvesting sisal when he was young. <laughs> In terms of the data, all utterances of phrasal length or longer which occur in my database are given with a unique identifier, which occurs to the right of the first uh, line of the gloss. These unique identifiers are made up of two parts, uh, an alphanumeric code to the left of a full stop and a number to the right of a full stop. The alphanumeric code refers to the file name in which the recording can be found. And so any interested listener can navigate to the Gorwa archival deposit and then enter that file name into the search bar highlighted here. This will in turn return all of the files and folders associated with that file name, including the recording itself, as well as XML files created with the Alon software, which can be used to see transcriptions and translations of the audiovisual material. The number to the right of the full stop refers to the utterance number within the audiovisual file in which the utterance occurred. So once the ALON file has been downloaded, one can navigate to that utterance number in the ALON file and listen to that utterance, as well as check it within its larger context. So our example uh, is uh, highlighted here in the ALON file. I should add that all of the data I'll be using today was funded by two separate grants from the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, as well as a grant from the Firebird Foundation for Anthropological Research. To begin, and as mentioned at the outset, Gorwa linkers occur in six distinct forms. The ta of Shufitawak, one lip. The r with high tone of desir e, uh, my girl. 
the O uh, with the high tone of Hawato Baba, uh, Father's Man, the K and high tone of Kurki, this year, the high toned A of Aima Uren, Big Lands, and the high tone of Aila Tair, uh, a long wedding song. These linkers are all agreeing for the gender of their nominal, and as such, we might think that there are six genders in Gorwa. Uh, in fact, it's a bit more nuanced than that. Uh, take, for example, these two forms, Hawata, Men, and Kuru, Year. When used in larger phrases, uh, we can see that they trigger the same agreement pattern on verbs, specifically a supersegmental operation which lowers the tone. Compare Hawata now with Desi, girl, and Aila, wedding song. Each of these nouns trigger a distinct agreement pattern on the verb. Girl triggers a supersegmental operation which shortens the vowel of the verb, and wedding songs results in a segmental suffix ya. As such, of these six linkers, we see that in terms of agreement on elements beyond the noun, they can be organized into three patterns, which in South Cushitic we call feminine, masculine, and neuter. In fact, the only time when these more specific patterns, for example, the fact that the noun Lufi takes a linker ta and the noun desi takes a linker r with high tone, it's actually on the linker itself. Otherwise, the noun for lip and the noun for girl show the same agreement. This is a pattern known as subgender, where nouns of a given gender may show two different patterns in a very small subset of agreement environments. And as mentioned above, the element with which the linker is agreeing for gender is the nominal. But there's an important distinction to make here. The element that dictates the gender of the nominal in Gorwa is not the noun as traditionally conceived, that is, the highlighted forms here, nor is it the nominal roots as highlighted here. In fact, what controls the gender of linkers in Gorwa, and indeed the gender of the entire noun, is the nominal suffix, the forms highlighted here. This is a salient characteristic of Gorwa nouns, and I think it's worth making a brief note of here by way of digression. Consider these two nouns, lip and girl. As we have seen above, the noun for lip in Gorwa is feminine, triggering morphological agreement patterns which are characteristically feminine in Gorwa. However, if we pluralize lip to lips, the agreement pattern is now different. It is a neuter noun. The noun for girl works differently. In the singular, girl triggers feminine agreement as the noun for lip above. But in the plural form, girls, agreement is masculine. As such, while lip is feminine and lips is neuter, girl is feminine and girls is masculine. In fact, virtually all combinations of genders exist. A neuter noun may pluralize to feminine, a masculine noun may pluralize to neuter, etc. And this is mediated by a large number of nominal suffixes in Gorwa by which Nouns express different number valuations, singular, plural, as well as a zero value known as general number. We've only seen a small number of these suffixes in this talk, but the richness of the system means that the exponents of gender for nouns is complex, and that linkers, the object of our current inquiry, will vary depending on the number valuation of the noun. So, to review then, the linker in Gorwa has six separate forms, two for each gender. Gender in Gorwa is controlled by the nominal suffix, not by the root. And if the number of the noun changes, the gender of the noun may also change, and therefore uh, also the linker. Syntactically, nouns show the linker virtually everywhere except the following three environments. That is, if the subject is unmodified, that is, no adjective, quantifier, possessor, relative clause, etc., the linker is absent. As such, uh, in our example here, the noun garma here surfaces with no high tone, which would be how it would surface if it had a linker. Similarly, though with the need to be a bit more specific, unmodified nouns which occur in second position also show no linker. 
For our purposes, second position refers to the position directly before the preverbal clitic complex. And uh, preverbal clitic complexes are generally um, obligatory grammatical elements in uh, finite tensed clauses in Gorba. And in our present example, the preverbal clitic complex is nina. And in the example before, it is ina. So as such, the unmodified object noun baha, hyena, does not surface with its linker, R, in high tone. The linker is also absent in incorporated nouns, as in the example to the right, uh, where he, person, uh, does not occur with a high tone. The linker is present everywhere else. This includes the examples we've seen above of modified nouns, uh, here shown to the right, and another better contextualized example is uh, to the right now, where the noun is modified by a subject relative clause, the girl who is farming or the farming girl. And here we can see that it surfaces, the word girl surfaces with its linker R and high tone, again, because it is uh, modified. The linker is also present on what we call encapsulated nouns. And by encapsulated, which is a South Cushitic specific uh, term, I mean nouns that occur between the preverbal clitic complex and the lexical verb, but which are not incorporated. As such, the noun aima, food, surfaces with its linker r and high tone to be pronounced aimar. To summarize then, syntactically, the linker is absent on unmodified subjects, unmodified objects in second position, and on incorporated nouns and it's present everywhere else, including modified nouns, encapsulated nouns, and nouns with topic and question morphology. So now let's pass to uh, earlier analyses of uh, the linker. So uh, earlier accounts of Southern Cushitic languages, they characterize linkers as construct state morphology, which is a form taken by nouns in many Afroasiatic languages when possessed. So this actually does a good job of describing what is going on in many, if not most, of the commonest syntactic configurations in which we see the linker, including the two highlighted forms here, and especially in that for the highlighted form hato baba, which is father's man. We can see that this is a very common um, construction throughout Gorwa. It's a possession construction, and indeed the only way to tell that these two nouns uh, are in a possession construction is the fact that the word for man here, hawata, is in, uh, has its linker. So it's hawato, that's how we know that it's possessed. Um, and in fact, it's really not too much of a stretch to extend the concept of possession to cover other adjacent phenomenons, phenomena such as adjectival modification. After all, we can say something like a red cloak as well as a cloak of red in English. Uh, as well as quantification. So we can say things in English like an army of one, for example. So returning to our list of environments, the construct state analysis does a relatively good job when explaining the linker's occurrence on modified nouns. Unfortunately, it is less of a good match in describing the other environments in which the linker surfaces encapsulated nouns, and nouns with topic and question morphology. For example, it is hard here to see how the encapsulated noun aima could be conceived of as possessed in any straightforward way here. After all, the phrase means, if you want food, where the word for food is not possessed in any evident way. As such, I'd like to abandon the analysis of the linker as construct state morphology in favor of, ana of an analysis of the linker as a marker of reference with a few important new hypotheses about its distribution. The first assumption will be that linkers are much more widespread. That is, they occur on all nouns with reference, that is, nouns which, which point to a real-world entity, but are unpronounced when their occurrence aligns with the right edge of a phonological phrase. So this would be similar to phenomena such as uh, Italian radopiamento syntactico, uh, Japanese rendaku, for example. And for our purposes, the most important phonological phrases would be equivalent to the syntactic determiner phrase and tense phrase. 
Seeing the determiner phrase as a phonological phrase immediately allows for a neat explanation of the highlighted environments. Nouns which are modified in Gorwa take most of their modification to the right. As such, the linker does not occur at the right edge of the determiner phrase and is therefore pronounced in surface form. Topic and question morphology also criticizes to the right of the noun, so I expect that the same principle applies. The explanation for unmodified subjects and unmodified objects in second position not displaying their linker is essentially the converse. Here, because an unmodified noun does not have material to the right edge of the linker within the determiner phrase, the linker aligns with the DP right edge and must therefore go unpronounced. The same argument applies for object nouns in second position, the underlying assumption being that they do not exist within a tense phrase. This is in direct contrast with encapsulated nouns, which do occur within the tense phrase. I considered treating Gorwa clausal syntax for this talk, but because of time restrictions, I will risk a simplified account. So, if we accept the core of the preverbal clitic complex to be a tense head, which seems to make sense given that the preverbal clitic complexes are mandatory in Gorwa in all finite clauses with tense, the preverbal clitic complex can be seen as the beginning of the tense phrase. And as such, the unmodified object in second position is outside of the TP by virtue of being to the left of the preverbal clitic complex. And the encapsulated noun is inside of the TP by virtue of it being located to the right of the preverbal clitic complex and uh, to the left of the lexical verb. This would account for why one surfaces without its linker pronounced, whereas the other does. The final environment for which to account is the incorporated noun, such as the example given to the left. By our last argument, the noun he, person, is indisputably within the tense phrase, as it occurs between the preverbal clitic complex and the lexical verb. But it does not surface with its linker, which in this case would be high tone. The form seems virtually the same as the encapsulated form, but I'd like to submit, however, that the essential difference is that in the above example, an incorporation construction, the incorporated noun man does not actually refer to any real-world entity, whereas the noun food in the encapsulation construction does. Here, we can see a few examples of incorporation constructions in Gorwa. Note that none of these nouns are arguments, but are rather lexicalized or at least semi-lexicalized elements adding meaning to the verb. In the second example, the form saga quadim does not mean head lose in any sort of literal sense, but rather forget. As such, there is no real world head being lost in this phrase. Um, in the third example, the form aslo kasi does not mean fires put in any sort of literal sense, but rather fire up. And as such, there is no real world fire being placed anywhere in this phrase. This is especially evident when we look at this third example and we can see that the argument marking on the preverbal clitic complex is uh, for a neuter gender patient as highlighted. And therefore, this uh, preverbal clitic complex is agreeing with the vehicles as an argument and not the fire as an argument. Simply put, none of these nouns is available as an argument and this is because they don't, in any straightforward sense, refer to a real-world entity. They have no referent, and as such, they therefore have no linker. This is patently different in encapsulation constructions, as we can see in the second example here below, such as uh, this one here. In encapsulation constructions, we in fact can see a whole host of elements occurring between the preverbal clitic complex and the lexical verb. In the first example, it is an argument now, and in the second example, it's an oblique argument. So in the first example, bar aymar sa, that word aima is an argument, that is, it's the thing that is wanted here, it's an argument of the verb. And in this second example here, pindo kan taang what we see is taang, which means in the middle, 
is, uh, is an oblique argument. It's talking about a place, a location that the plank is being cut in. So we can see that not just uh, these direct arguments are encapsulated in these constructions. You can actually get obliques uh, encapsulated as well. So compare the first example here, which is an encapsulation construction, i alu ge'er, it is looking back, where the um, noun alu, behind, is encapsulated, and compare that with the second example here, alu nin ge'er, which is not encapsulated. We can see that the argument uh, noun, the object, occurs to the left here of the preverbal clitic complex. Here we can see that when encapsulated, the preverbal clitic complex behaves as if the verb were intransitive, whereas the non-encapsulated example below, the preverbal clitic complex marks both an agent and a patient. So the placement of the noun alu behind here is affecting the argument structure of the clause and is therefore sort of easier to see as an argument rather than these incorporated nouns that we saw above. To review then, my analysis is that linkers occur obligatorily on any noun with reference, but are unpronounced at the right edge of a phonological phrase. And the linker is absent on unmodified subjects, unmodified objects in second position, and incorporated nouns. And the linker is present everywhere else. That includes modified nouns, encapsulated nouns, and nouns with topic and question morphology. With that said, however, my analysis is not the last word on linkers in Gorwa. So we see in uh, CARE 2020, an article dealing with a different, though adjacent, uh, topic. It's argued therein that, according to my earlier work in my dissertation, that the linker is a determiner head marking referentiality, as I've explained in this talk. The fact that the linker and uh, the uh, suffix that uh, she is looking at in, in this particular paper may appear in non-specific contexts such as negation, where the noun cannot be referential, argues against this analysis of the linker. I leave the question of whether the linker has any semantic import or whether it is simply conditioned by the phonology and syntactic structure to further study. So here, in a paper that uh, it must be admitted doesn't directly deal with the linker but does encounter it and make comment on it uh, over the course of uh, her analysis, uh, she, uh, there is data that is uh, found that seems to uh, contradict or militate against this linker as a referentiality marker analysis. Um, now, it's not, uh, it's not established what the linker could possibly be in lieu of it not being a referentiality marker. That's left for further study, and, and fair enough, because it's not the, it's not the, um, the uh, target of analysis for this paper. But this gives us an interesting opportunity to sort of go to the data that's used and uh, return and think a little bit about this. So let's do that together. So this, again, uh, is supported by data from my own collection. In fact, CARE 2020 relies uh, on data uh, in the same database that I rely. Uh, so it's the exact same data, and in many cases, um, the glossing and uh, transcription was done uh, by me. So we can see in this example here, uh, we can see that there are linkers uh, noted on negated constituents. And indeed, if this were the case, it would definitely complicate my reference marker analysis. I'd like then to examine the data carefully. So in the current example, it is actually quite difficult to hear if there is a linker, as phonologically the morpheme is a vowel, which occurs between two other vowels, and actually it surfaces because of vowel coalescence rules simply as a. Ah. So we get the form ninga he ka, and we don't actually see that linker, or we don't actually hear the linker, but um, we assume it's there, or at least it's written to be there in the transcription translation. A better example is this one, which is also cited in CARE 2020. Here, the linker should be a bit easier to hear because it is a consonant between two vowels. I've dug up the recording so we can give it a listen here. Let me play it. And it becomes immediately evident that even here, it's hard to hear the linker. I expect this has to do with the fact that the pharyngeal fricative 
pers persists through the short vowel. In fact, this was actually the best example I could find in my entire database and really sort of makes me wonder if the linker is actually there or not. Um, it should be noted again that the data in CARE 2020 relies on my own transcription and translation. So her conclusions rely in many ways on how good I originally heard the material. And in this case, there may be more work to be done. And it should also be underscored, it should be said again, that this detail is not the central focus of CARE 2020, and its validity or otherwise doesn't directly affect the central argument she makes in the paper. A further example I found is this one, someone asking, it wasn't God. This is a common rhetorical device in Gorwa during storytelling to elicit a response from the listeners. So in this case, the speaker wants to confirm whether the listeners think it was God who took away the powers of the traditional doctors, or whether it was the traditional doctor himself, Sagila Magina, who did it. And so what the speaker does is he asks, it wasn't God to get a response uh, from the speakers or from the listeners, which would be uh, stereotypically here. They would respond, uh, yes, it was God. Um, so um, we can listen to the recording here. It's a bit hard to hear, but in this case, the linker is certainly there. Let's listen. <laughs> I'll play it again. <laughs> we can clearly hear Ako uh, Kwezo saying, which is, we can really hear that the linker is present here. But in this case, the construction is different from the ones given above in that it is not the, the, the noun God being negated here, but it's the involvement of God in the um, relevant action. So this is an important distinction in that the word loa is still referring to a real-world entity here. So, at present, the argument that linkers are not reference marker hinges on one example, which, after listening to a bit more closely, might have been mistranscribed, and, and that would have been uh, my uh, doing. So CARE 2020 also mentions an example from Iraq, a closely related language to Gorwa, which is the same construction, and which also occurs with a linker in the uh, transcription. With this said, however, it's once again a vowel or semi-vowel occurring between two other vowels. Ideally, we would be able to check this with an example in which the linker occurs as a consonant. So to conclude then, Morphologically, linkers show six forms which agree in gender with the nominal suffix of the noun. Syntactically, the linker is absent on unmodified subjects, unmodified objects in second position, and on incorporated nouns. Functionally, the linker is present in too wide a range of morphosyntactic environments to be satisfactorily labeled as construct state. And as such, the linker is possibly an obligatory morpheme marking reference, present on all nouns, bearing reference, and unpronounced at the right edge of a phonological phrase. In this case, that would be the determiner phrase DP and tense phrase TP, though the role of the linker as a marker of reference has not yet been satisfactorily demonstrated. And so thank you for uh, coming to my talk, and here are my references.